Welcome back to Season 2 of 12 Days in March. In Part 1 of this two-part video series, I presented an overview of the pericardial disorders as well as a review of acute pericarditis. In this section, we will finish our presentation of pericardial disorders with a review of cardiac tamponade and constrictive pericarditis. As a reminder, please be aware that all the 12 Days in March presentations have accompanying PDFs available at the website. They are free and available for downloading. No registration, no nothing. And wait, if you order now. Just kidding. In the previous section, we introduced the language of pericardial disorders, and we'll pick up our discussion with cardiac tamponade. So what are the scenarios in which you'll be confronted with tamponade questions? The big ticket item is any patient with a description that sounds like they have pulsus paradoxus, which we'll cover in detail shortly. Tamponade is generally described by Beck's triad, which also includes JVD and hypotension. I mention the triad not because it is a test question, rather, almost all vignettes addressing tamponade does include this triad of findings. Insofar as the underlying conditions, these will be the key derivatives. That is, they will describe a patient with tamponade physiology and then ask you to identify the most likely underlying cause. I will remind you that transmural MI with free wall rupture occurs during the macrophage phase of injury. Aortic dissection can extend proximately, causing acute aortic insufficiency with hemopericardium. The dissection would likely occur in a hypertensive patient and will be identified by the characteristic ripping or tearing sensation between the shoulder blades, or it might occur in the setting of an MVA with that tear initiating at the ligamentum arteriosum. Don't forget about our ever-popular stab victim. If this poor guy who gets stabbed isn't developing shock from a tension pneumothorax, then he'll be suffering with tamponade. This chap just can't catch a break. Both infection and neoplasm can be associated with tamponade. The main relevance of neoplasm is to highlight the idea of acute tamponade from brisk rupture compared to the slow development of a serous effusion that accumulates over time. A slow growing effusion typically gives rise to the classic radiographic features such as globular or water bottle heart that we'll review shortly. So let's come back to pulsus paradoxus. This really is the key feature of tamponade and an understanding of why it occurs underscores the pathophysiologic basis of cardiac tamponade. So pulsus is defined by a drop in systolic blood pressure of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury with inspiration. That implies we all have some degree of pulsus paradoxus. That is a drop in our blood pressure with inspiration. Under normal circumstances, inspiration causes a drop in intrathoracic pressure with an increase in venous return to our right heart chambers. As a result of ventricular interdependence, the increased venous return to the right chambers does result in a decrease in pulmonary venous return to the left chambers. Under normal circumstances, this change in blood pressure is not even detected. So what happens in tamponade? We'll begin this story by describing the normal pressure volume relationship between the cardiac chambers and the pericardial sac. The sac, composed of fibroelastic tissue, is normally filled with less than 50 milliliters of serous fluid. Elastic implies there is some distensibility. Under normal circumstances, the fluid exerts negligible transmural pressure across the cardiac chambers. In fact, the pressure variation with respiration, noted as plus 5 to minus 5, mirrors the normal swing in intrathoracic pressure seen during respiration. Just to be clear, inspiration normally results in a decrease in intrapericardial pressure. We will return to this point during our discussion of the physical exam. So what happens if fluid accumulates in that fibroelastic sac and exceeds the limits of pericardial stretch? You will see on the graphic that the speed of fluid accumulation does impact the clinical presentation. This is purely informational, not forming the basis of any specific question on step one, although they could certainly compare and contrast the disorders previously mentioned with examples being dissection versus neoplasm. The other key point in this slide is the rapid vertical rise in intrapericardial pressure once that limit of stretch is reached. It only takes a small volume of additional fluid to convert an innocent pericardial effusion into a disastrous hemodynamic catastrophe. So here it goes. Pulsus paradoxus can be thought of as a direct result of competition between the right and left sides of the heart for limited space. Cardiac filling becomes a zero-sum gain. For the right heart to fill more, 
the left heart must fill less. In tamponade, all the cardiac chambers are compressed to some extent. But when the intrapericardial pressures exceed diastolic pressures, tamponade physiology is seen. For the right heart to fill more, during inspiration, the left heart must fill less. Since the free wall of the right ventricle cannot distend into the pericardial space, the interventricular septum must bulge into the left ventricular chamber. The combination of decreased pulmonary venous return to the left chambers and the IV septum bulging into the left chamber result in a decrease in cardiac output. This is clinically recognized by pulses paradoxus. And this slide demonstrates graphically what we just described. You can see expiration and inspiration labeled at the top of the tracing. During expiration, the aortic pressure is noted around 100 over 60, and the bottom tracing, you see a relative decrease in the right ventricular pressure. But look what happens during inspiration. The aortic pressure reflecting left heart cardiac output drops below 80 over 60, while the right ventricular pressure rises. This is an exact representation of what occurs in pulses paradoxus. Increased right heart filling causes bowing of the IV septum into the left ventricular cavity. The result is an abnormally large drop in systolic blood pressure during inspiration, resulting from a decrease in stroke volume. So that is the pathophysiologic basis for cardiac tamponade. Understanding tamponade is insufficient if you can't understand how the vignettes typically describe pulses paradoxes. So here is the language. In the first vignette, they describe a blood pressure cuff inflated to 120 millimeters of mercury and then slowly decreased. Just as a point of information, when you are assessing a patient for pulses paradoxus, you do increase the blood pressure cuff in excess of the systolic pressure. You then slowly deflate the cuff. So they go on to describe at 100 millimeters of mercury, the first Karatkov sound is only heard during expiration. The Karatkov sound is heard throughout the respiratory cycle, i.e. during inspiration, at a pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury, representing a pulses of 20 millimeters of mercury. Be on the lookout for variants on this theme. A simpler and much more straightforward version is disappearance of pulse during inspiration. In the first vignette, the wording is designed to drive you nuts and consume time. In the second one, it is simply yet elegantly stated, hoping you won't notice. The derivatives then focus either on causes of tamponade or choosing between the common pericardial disorders, and I just listed some examples. So here is a summary of the physical exam findings. We already discussed pulses and the associated hypotension due to decreased stroke volume. JVD will be present. I emphasize that point so you don't get confused by the absence of Kussmaul sign. Remember this little flashback from earlier? I mentioned that the intrapericardial pressure mirrors the normal swings in intrathoracic pressures during respiration. So this little gem underscores that the decrease in intrapericardial pressure permits an increase in right-sided chamber filling, thereby explaining the absence of Kussmaul's. That is, there is no paradoxical rise in the jugular venous pressure with inspiration. Quite the contrary, the increased right-sided filling occurs at the expense of the left-sided cavities. I'm beating this point to death because it becomes a key distinction from constricted pericarditis that we'll cover later in this presentation. And for completeness, the heart sounds may be described as distant or muffled. This is in keeping with the presence of fluid between cavitary sounds and our ability to hear them. Recall that the patient with a pleural effusion is noted with decreased breath sounds, and so it goes with the patient who has fluid in the pericardial sac. Decreased sounds. Sound does not transmit through fluid. Finally, a friction rub may be described if the cause of tamponade is related to acute pericarditis, such as in an infection. Insofar as data, none of these will be deal breakers on step one and are included for completeness. Note the echocardiogram. The test is certainly indicated in any patient suspected of having cardiac tamponade. A pericardial effusion will be noted with the additional findings of chamber collapse. Right atrial collapse is the most sensitive finding, whereas collapse of either ventricles will be a specific finding for tamponade physiology.
Insofar as chest x-ray findings, the description of globular or water bottle cardiac silhouettes depends on the speed of accumulation. I only include these in case a vignette includes a description of the chest radiograph. Likewise, you should be vaguely familiar with the two electrocardiographic descriptions associated with tamponade. The first one is low voltage characterized by QRS amplitude of less than 5 millimeters in the limb leads or 10 millimeters in the precordial leads. It is unlikely you'll see an EKG in tamponade, let alone need to interpret voltage. If you are going to see an EKG with tamponade, this would be the one. Electrical alternance. It is simply defined by QRS complexes of varying amplitude between beats. The pattern literally correlates with the swinging of the heart in that fluid-filled pericardial sac. And finally, you won't confuse a patient with tamponade, but they do like to fool around with pulses paradoxus. The two conditions besides tamponade where you apt to see pulses described include status asthmaticus and constricted pericarditis, which will be covered in the next set of slides. Insofar as asthma is concerned, pulses does correlate with the degree of respiratory distress. Based on our discussions of pulses, you can envision a hyperinflated patient with exaggerated inspiratory efforts causing swings in intrathoracic pressures, which will result in alterations of venous return. Just be on the lookout. They can certainly create treacherous vignettes in a patient with dyspnea and pulses paradoxus. You would generally be supplied, however, with clues such as a young patient with eczema and the presence of wheezing. So that's all I have on tamponade. We'll finish our review of pericardial disorders with a discussion of constricted pericarditis. This disorder is fairly straightforward with a couple of key distinguishing features which we'll highlight in the next several slides. So if you understand just one thing about constricted pericarditis, let it be the physiologic basis for Kussmaul sign. If you understand this, you understand the disorder and the associated derivatives. Oh no, one of my homegrown drawings. I know it sucks, but it will get the point across. So what is the normal physiologic response to inspiration? There is a decrease in the intrathoracic pressure, which results in an increase in venous return. Great stuff. So blood returns to the right chamber, the ventricle expands, and the jugular venous pressure falls, characterized by flattening of the neck veins. So far, so good. But what happens if I encase the heart in a very stiff, inelastic, fibrocalcific shell, and the ventricles cannot expand to accommodate the increased volume generated during inspiration? Can you see that inelastic fibrocalcific shell I've drawn? The increased volume of blood cannot enter the ventricles. The ventricles are not expanding to accommodate the increased venous return. So what we see is a distension of the neck veins during inspiration. The jugular venous pulse paradoxically rises due to the inability of the ventricles to expand. Physiologically, here is the take-home point. Constricted pericarditis is not a pumping problem. It is a ventricular filling problem. So here comes the derivatives. If you can't fill the ventricle and blood is backing up into the jugular vein, where else might it be manifest? Yes, there will be peripheral edema on a hydrostatic basis, but step one seems to love constricted pericarditis as a disease prototype associated with congestive hepatopathy. And although we cover that in the liver section, nutmeg liver is generally described as a manifestation of right-sided heart failure. Be familiar with the pathologic description of zone three central lobular hemorrhagic necrosis. So we're on the home stretch. You've identified the patient as having constricted pericarditis. You need an etiology to cause the problem. And whereas uremia, TB, and postcardiotomy syndrome are probably most common, they do love the patient with Hodgkin lymphoma who received mantle irradiation 30 years earlier. Please also be familiar with the pathologic description of the pericardium as consisting of dense or thick fibrocalcific scar. Insofar as the physical exam, it would be nice if they gave you a pericardial knock. Note, this is a sound and not a murmur, and the sound is simply the ventricle banging into the calcified pericardium. And here is the million dollar slide and where we bring together two key concepts. During tamponade, we emphasize the absence of Kussmaul's. That was explained by the ability of the right ventricle to accommodate venous return at the expense of left ventricular outflow. The other key finding with tamponade was the presence of pulses paradoxus due to bowing of the interventricular septum. Compare and contrast with constricted pericarditis. 
for reasons already discussed, Kussmaul sign is present and pulses paradoxus may be present. Returning venous blood can generate sufficient pressure to impact the intraventricular symptom. Thus, the important and distinguishing feature of Kussmaul's. It is subtle, and clinically the presentations are not too confusing, but on a USMLE vignette, this distinction is nice fodder for a difficult question. And finally, do be aware of the other ventricular filling disorders. Whereas constricted pericarditis is described as an obstruction to filling, restrictive heart disease is better understood as impaired ventricular relaxation. The prototypic conditions are amyloid and diastolic dysfunction, also referred to as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. These will be further discussed during our presentation of restrictive cardiomyopathies. And that will conclude our two-part series on pericardial disorders for USMLE Step 1. If you have any questions or concerns, please email me at howard at 12daysinmarch.com. Thank you.